Hello, welcome to Art Online. My uh, guest today is uh, Finn Dack. Um, hi, Finn. How are you? Hey, how are you doing? You good? <laughs> You're brilliant, actually. Fantastic. I, I, you know, I've been a fan of your work for some time, and you may not know this, but when I first moved down to um, sort of East London in 2012, one of the first pieces of work that I saw was yours. And you might remember, do you remember, it was it's on Hanbury Street, and it was a, a girl with a red band which yeah. is your signature and do you remember that piece at all do you remember when you, yeah, you, you did that well piece? i do because that was the first piece that i'd done in that style oh is that right yeah yeah yeah. so i had um i had been painting asian girls probably for about two or uh, two years maybe three years before that but nobody was really taking any notice of them because there wasn't really anything to you know signify that okay that's that's finn's work you know um, but then in the studio, I was sort of developing some ideas with um, stencil work, like just um, single layer stencils. Um, but I wanted to add more depth to them. So what I, what I started doing was I started using a stencil as a template and then like fixing the stencil to the wall, rolling it down, painting in the, the stencil itself, rolling it up, keeping it up there in place, and then shading inside the, the silhouette to kind of give the shade of the, the, you know, the shadows of the nose and the chin and whatever else. Just give it a, a bit more depth than a sort of a single black and white stencil. And the reason for trying that was because I was still doing illegal work at the time. And, you know, when you're doing multi-layer stencils, previously it had been really quick to get them up, but Montana Gold changed the... Um, the mixture of their paint. And so suddenly it, thought it wasn't drying very quickly anymore. It would take like each layer, maybe like five minutes to dry. And if you put the stencil back in your stencil case during that time, they'd stick together. So there was a definite like sort of um, reasoning or frame of mind, which was sort of telling me, okay, well, if I only have one stencil, I can get it up really quick and I can be gone before anyone sort of like comes along and catches me. And so, as part of that thought process and as part of that paring down of the stenciling, I was trying to find a way to make them more recognizable and more iconic. And that splash across the face or across the eyes was the thing that I went with. And that particular piece that you saw, I had painted it at a friend's apartment, um, maybe like three or four weeks beforehand. Um, another artist friend of mine, Ben Slow, and, um, I think we kind of realized when I put it up how strong or impactful it was. So I was like, okay, I've definitely got to paint that in the street somewhere. And then another friend of ours found that wall. It had been painted illegally once, but um, our friend was working in that area and he spoke to the owner of the building and he said, look, would you mind us curating that wall so that like it's done properly and it's not, um, you know, it's not just mashed up and tagged and whatever else. And so that, that wall is still running. It, like it, loads, of people, loads of people have painted that wall now. But I think I might have been the very first one to do it legally. I didn't, yeah. didn't realise there was such a backstory to that because now I know that wall, you know, in, in, I'm going up Brick Lane all the time, up and down Hanbury Street all the time. One of the best spots to see street art. If you want to see good yeah. quality street art, you go down to that section, intersection, Brick Lane yeah. and Hanbury Street. And you see some yeah, so that, that empty lot with the, the rower piece on it, that was yes. essentially, I think, what made that little area, that locale so important because once I think people in that little area realized that, okay, that piece of street art is getting a hell of a lot of attention, I think they kind of just were more open to um, having like local people curating the walls for them because, you know, business owners like restaurants, they don't necessarily know what's good or bad art and so they were able to just like hand off that curation to local guys and I just happened to be one of the first. So that, and that's a super important piece for me as well anyway. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah it, it, we, uh, there was, I think we painted on a bank holiday weekend, um, probably around like April of whatever that was, 2012. And um, Ben Slow was painting across the road from me. Louis Massai was painting down the road, and so was um, Flem. Mm. So we were all painting on this bank holiday weekend. The, the weather was amazing. And like for me, the reaction to that piece made me realize, okay, this is definitely something that I should 
uh, continue along with like, like that kind of theme of like rock and roll style grungy kind of girls with uh, the paint splash and you know that has developed into what I do now but um, it's been a long time in kind of uh, getting from there to here. Well, it's become what you've been known for really now isn't it I mean it was, yeah. that 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 piece then was that when you say it sort of started you on that journey did it start you thinking more about the street art scene and actually painting big on, on walls and what is no did it... what it did was so I had been made redundant uh, from my job or laid off my job literally like <clears throat> two months earlier and I remember distinctly I, I did an exhibition with a friend in the hospital club in London just like literally a week after I was made redundant and I had in my head I kind of decided okay I, I don't want another job in this field I was a digital um, developer like for advertising agency I didn't want to go, I didn't want to continue doing that I was doing the art on the side for about four years prior to that and I really just wanted to make a go of it and lots of things all kind of came together and conspired in the same time period and one of the things that happened was that uh, an old manager of mine had said to me you've got to stop painting the Asian girls because he couldn't sell them and in my kind of ignorant and foolish way I thought no fuck you I'm, I'm not going to stop doing it this is what I want to do so all I have to do is I have to figure out a way to make them more appealing more iconic and more recognizable so that it becomes almost like your brand you know you can you can say the same for people like Obey yes his work has developed over the years and he's known for doing lots of different things but essentially the stencil style is still what He's known. Still recognizable, known. isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. instantly recognizable thing. Um, <clears throat> and of course, my recognizable thing is a, mo a lot more simplistic, but it, it doesn't matter. It's like um, uh, people like stick, yeah. you know, your stick men. They look simple, but whatever. He still is the person who's known for doing those now. And um, someone like Jeff Aerosol, the stencils themselves might not, um, you might not be able to tell him apart, but when you see that there's a little red arrow somewhere on the wall, you know that it's Jeff Aerosol. It can be mm -hmm. such a simple thing, but it still means that you're kind of recognized for something specific and you, the work that you do is never going to be mistaken for somebody else's. So what happened in that period of time was I decided I was gonna become a full-time artist. I decided I was gonna keep painting the Asian girls. And I just set myself a task to um, make them more iconic. And two months after that, I painted the first piece in the studio with a line across the eyes. And it's still on Flickr to this day, um, where I posted it and I was asking my artist friends, you know, this is a new thing I'm trying. I've, I like the line across the face, but it's not right. I need to do something else with it, but I wasn't sure what to do. So I was just kind of like getting some advice from other people. And some people said they liked it the way it was and others said, try this, try that. And in the end, that piece in Hanbury Street was one of the defining moments of that because what I decided to do was that I was just gonna throw some colored paint on the wall, let it drip down, and then I was gonna paint the stencil on top. But when I painted the piece at Ben Slow's apartment, it became really obvious to me that, okay, you can't just have the, the paint flowing all the way down their face. There has to be some kind of form to it because otherwise the features just get lost. So the first thing I done was I, I whited out that area there so that none of the, the paint splashes or the paint drips would come anywhere near this part. Uh -huh. And so over time, I just honed it and perfected it to where it just became a mask. Wow, that was it, gosh. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, you know, and, and, and for me, seeing this from the completely other end, you know, I just wandered yeah. up, saw it, I thought, wow, this is great, I love street art, how cool is this? So I remember those walls, yeah. I remember yours, I remember Ben Slow's opposite. Um, Did it? Oh. Um, was he there as well, was he? Yeah, Grimshaw did it. Yeah, oh yeah, there was quite a few people have done that wall, yeah. There's been loads. There's been so loads it's an amazing people. spot. In fact, both of those walls, um, Mia's done the one opposite as well that's right he has quite a lot of problems yeah there's controversy on that one yeah yeah something to do with bankers or something i think yeah so i i um i wanted to take you back in time a little bit further because one of the reasons i really um, wanted to speak to you is because you posted something on social media I forget which which element which bit it was 
But you, you talked about your experience going to the Cannes Festival, which, is, yeah. uh, which was a big festival at the time. It was in 2008. It was on the Leak Street Tunnel, which we now know as the Graffiti Tunnel, sometimes known as the Banksy Tunnel. Yeah. And there was this big sort of event put on by Banksy himself with a whole bunch of street eyes. I think you were just going there looking at the, um, the yeah. art at the time. Yeah. Can you tell us about that, that time and, and how it impacted you? Yes. So the period that I just talked about when I did the piece in Hanbury Street, that was literally four years later. And so these were, these were two um, pivotal moments in my career, ironically. The thing that, what that happened with the, the Cannes Film Festival was that's the point, the point at which I was still working in the digital advertising arena. And so I was working in London. I was old at the time, like my career had, uh, I had done various other bits and pieces in my life until I got to digital advertising. And digital advertising was the place where I felt more at home, or most at home, I should say, in an office anyway. And so I was surrounded by like kids who were like, you know, 15, 20 years younger than me. And they were all into all kinds of stuff. And it was a really like vibrant um, environment. And of course, I had just started painting as a, a sort of a art therapy thing. I had come out of a very bad breakup where I wasn't seeing my kids and all this kind of stuff and gone through court cases. And I just basically decided to paint to um, take my mind off things when I was at home or to just lose myself in, in, in actual fact. And because I was in this job and I was surrounded by guys who were like 22, 23, 24, 25, they were all into street art. And so they were sort of, not sort of pointing me in that direction, but just kind of saying, oh yeah, have you seen this? And have you seen that? And of course I hadn't. And then I started getting into it. And then a few months later, the Cannes Festival was on and we were like, oh, we've got to go and see that. And so we did and it was, it was an incredible experience, um, not least because there was like thousands of people queuing to get into a tunnel. And the tunnel is open to the public like most of the year round, like you can walk through that tunnel. It is a public ac uh, access way. Um, but so we queued up and for those that don't know, Leak Street Tunnel is, I don't know, maybe half a mile long mm. and it's dark and it's dingy and it's, cold and it's damp and they had they had taken over the whole place and it wasn't just um stencil art it was all kinds of things there was like installations there was busted up cars and it was super inspiring and in two different ways one way because it was like oh my god this is fucking amazing and also on the other hand it was like ah but there's some stuff here that i'm sure i could do better than that or at least I'm sure I could do that. And so I, I came away from there thinking, yeah, I can do that. I can definitely do that. Because I was, I was kind of, I wasn't necessarily searching for a way forward with my art uh, career, because it wasn't a career at that point. I was just painting because I loved doing it. And because I was so enthusiastic and so into the street art, I thought, well, I may as well just apply my enthusiasm to this. And all I did was I, you know, I went off and I got some spray paint, which I had never used before. I got some stencil um, material, which I had never used before and made a schoolboy error in getting the wrong thing. But it didn't matter. Like I, I still did the first piece and it turned out okay. Where was that? Where was that, what, that first piece? Where did you do it? That first piece was a, it's a, it's a pretty dark piece, actually. It's a, it's a diptych. It's two different things. And it's based around a lyric by a band called the Weepies about ironically waking up in, and wanting to die. All right. But yeah, the, the thing is that the lyric is uh, often misunderstood because he's actually just talking about the fact that he's woken up with a hangover. Right. You know, sometimes you do say that to yourself, don't you? Where you're like, oh my God, I feel like dying. Um, yes. But actually in the context of the piece that I was painting, it made sense for it to be misunderstood anyway. Uh -huh. Um, and so, yes, it's a diptych of a girl lying down on her back. It's actually, it was based on, um, a drawing that I had done at some life, life drawing class, like a few years earlier and I had just kept it. Um, and so I just, I, I reproduced it as a stencil and it worked out. Okay. I've still got it somewhere in storage. Um, I don't think I'll ever get rid of it just because it is like the, the first piece I done and it's, you know, looking back on it, it's terrible. 
but it didn't matter because it was good enough to sort of to give me the impetus to go forward with it more. And then what I did was I, um, I, I joined up with like Flickr, which is, I guess, the sort of the former day Instagram thing. That's right. And yeah. There was lots of other street artists on there and the community on there was really supportive and you just post your stuff and put it into some of the street art groups and tag it with street art or whatever. And lots of people started commenting and I would be commenting on theirs and then I got became friends with them. And as I said in that post that you saw, it was on Instagram, by the way, um, I became friends with some of them and some of them I became very, very good friends with and hung out with them for years and did loads of paint jams together and loads of like, I guess, illegal uh, paint things. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm, I'm still friends with some of them to this day. So that, that, that moment then, again, you know, to, that sem seminal moment when it, so it seems like it opened you hours, it was like a wow moment. It's like, I can do this. Yep. I can just give this a go. Um, and I don't know why I thought that. You don't? Because I had never spray painted before. I had never stenciled before. I knew nothing about that world, nothing about that community. But for some reason, in the same way that when I broke up uh, with my ex-partner, I knew that I had to paint in order to uh, get myself through that difficult period. In the same way, as soon as I saw stencil art, and you know, there's stuff from, from like people like Logan Hicks, of course, Banksy, Elis, um, Italian guys like Luca Maleante, Spanish uh, Bitoy, Hosh. Like, it was just incredible to me. Were they all, I mean, were they all at, at that festival? I they, were, they were painted at that festival. Yeah. They weren't there at the point when they left the um, the public in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just like, as soon as I saw it, I, I just knew, okay, that's what I have to do. And I mean, ironically, the stenciling period of my life only lasted maybe five years. Like I, I very quickly, I, when you saw that piece in 2012, that was when I was starting to get away from stencils simply because... Um, being laid off my job meant I could travel if I had the funds and if I could travel I could paint walls and with stenciling if if you don't have the right size stencil for the right wall then it becomes a problem it's only stencils are only good when you can figure out exactly what you're painting beforehand so that it fills the wall perfectly and so that um, sort of six to eight month period after I left work and I started to travel and I'd already pared the work down to just a simple stencil. And the simple stencil look was not for me. I, I, don't, I don't particularly like the, the Banksy-esque um, aesthetic. I wanted there to be more depth to it. So the, the adding of the extra spray paint for shading was again another step away from stenciling. And so it, it was the step into street art, but it definitely wasn't the, um, the, the principal point of departure, let's say. What sort of artwork were you doing before that? So you, you'd never had any experience doing picking up a spray or even considering going excellent. What, what were you doing before that? What's just, even if it was just, just for your personal self? Yeah, so the, the art therapy, it was just painting portraits. It was nothing more. I mean, it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a career at that point. It was just a hobby and it was a hobby designed to, um, to take my mind or to clear my mind from the shit that I was dealing with at the time. Um, as soon as I started stenciling, I, I think within a few months, I was doing a very Sin City style stuff. Um, they were called the Girls of Dat Town. The concept was that they were going to be a mix of um, the Sin City girls and the sort of um, boys of Dogtown, you know, the, the uh, Zephyr team. So they had to have that like skate punk attitude, but they also had to, the, the look and feel of them was very much that kind of black and white monochrome with blood splash or <laughs> presumably blood splash um, kind of canvases. So looking like sort of uh, gunshots in the canvas or whatever, and then the sexy girl over the top with tons of attitude and maybe some tattoos. And then I, I sort of changed very quickly because what I, what I realized in the street art world the time was that there wasn't a lot of um, what you would consider to be beautiful work. There was a lot of technically amazing work. There was a lot of social and political commentary work. And there was a lot of sexualization of, of women because if, if there was a, a street art piece that featured a woman, it was almost guaranteed to be a sex woman. And 
I had kind of got to a point where I just thought it's there's no point in me feeding into that rhetoric because it's not a it's a kind of an old way of thinking. Yeah. Um, and so what I wanted to do is I wanted to simplify the work, I wanted to soften the work, and I wanted to move away from sexualization or objectification. So the shift wasn't actually a huge shift. I mean, those early pieces, like the one that you saw in Hanbury, okay, that they, they're not sexualizing or objectifying, but the woman is still, still got that sort of like hard attitude or um, badass attitude for the want of a better word. Um, but it was a, it was a, a small enough shift and a large enough shift for me to be happy that I wasn't sexualizing and yeah. for the work to be accepted for not just the fact that it's a good looking girl, but there's something more to it. And that, that thing might be, um, undefinable or subconscious, but it is there. I noticed you, you said um, the girls of Dacktown earlier. That was what you called them. It, 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 there's got to be a link between that and your name. Is that okay? Yeah. Well, the thing is, the, the DAC is DAC is not, well, that's not my real name. That's an acronym. Um, it, was, uh, it was essentially the, the abbreviation of my uh, personal port, online portfolio. So the, um, the portfolio was called Dragon Armory Creative. And I had done this dragon logo for that, um, that website. And when I started painting, the idea was that I would sign the work with the dragon logo. Um, and so that nobody would know who I was. That didn't work out, of course, but that's beside the point. Um, the, you know, the idea was always to do it anonymously because I was, you know, street art at the time was mostly illegal yeah. stuff. Um, but also, at that point, the, the painting was just another thing that I was doing. Like I was doing graphic design, I was doing web design, I was doing web development, I was doing illustration, and art was just another thing to add into my personal portfolio. So it made sense for me to continue with that identity. The thing is, of course, as soon as I started painting and stenciling, that just snowballed like really quickly. Mm really quickly and everything else just completely fell by the wayside, including my um, enthusiasm for my nine to five. Um, but of course I, I retired the, the dragon logo a while ago as well. I don't know if you know that. I, I don't, I don't think, I'm not even sure I've ever seen the dragon lo logo. I'd, I'd, um, it was on that piece in Hanbury Street. Well, I didn't obviously didn't look detailed. <laughs> no, it was, it was always hidden. Like, oh, was it? Yeah, because well, what was the point of making it obvious? You wouldn't yeah. know what it Anyway, no, it didn't say um, FinDAC, it, it was just a, a logo. Yeah, a right, dragon. right. I'm going to go back through my archive and have a look at that now. That's yeah, there's no association whatsoever. And I think <laughs> there was a point in, in my actual career when I stopped using it. I only stopped using it because I was on a long tour, like for four or five months, and midway through, I ruined the stencil and I just didn't bother doing another one. And then at the end of that five months, I painted like four or five murals where there was no signature at all. And I didn't think there was a need for a signature because by this point, mm. the, the, the mask around the eyes has become the signature. And then what happened was just, I think two or three years ago, I was painting a mural in Denver with um, Kevin Lido, one of my friends. And it was a collaboration mural. And of course, he was signing his name to it. So I thought, well, I have to sign my name. I can't just leave it blank. So I came up with this the logo that I use now, which is based on kind of like Korean and um, Japanese kanji. Um, and it actually says my name for the first time ever. I've noticed you've been, um, you, you talked about traveling there and you, you do travel extensively around, or it seems, it appears that you travel extensively around, around the world, but most in particular recently, I've been seeing your work pop up in Australia, and New Zealand. I've been lucky enough to, to go to Australia recently and you know it, I mean it's great seeing your work everyone nice recognizable art in a country which has got superb street art really yeah. good stuff. Both, there. both of those countries. Oh, the I, level of level of artistry down there is phenomenal. Yeah I was blown both, away both by male it. Male and female. Yeah absolutely it's just incredible. What, so what, 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 what was the, what's the reasons? Why, how, how come you spend so much time in that part of the world? Well, twofold. The, the first easy answer is that it helps me get away from England for the winter. 
because I don't, I don't want to be here in the winter. Like, with it's the worst winter. places to go. Oh, yeah, exactly. But on top of that, so I was contacted a few years ago by a, an organization called Street Prince, and they, um, they had actually contacted me prior to this. They wanted to do some um, release a screen print with me, and I, I said no because my screen print um, market at the time was pretty much sewn up, and I, did, I didn't want to. I didn't want to change that. But anyway, they, they contacted me again and they said that they were doing a festival. And so I went down there for their first festival and um, they were a Maori couple, like uh, local indigenous people. And I just, I really got on with them. Like I went there for the festival with the intention of just staying for the, the five days or whatever it was. And this, and is, this is New Zealand, was it? This is in New Zealand, yeah. yeah. And then my intention was to hop over to Australia because if you're down there, it makes sense to do both. Mm -hmm. Um, and paint some murals there because I knew I knew some people like Finton McGee and Roan and some others down in um, Sydney and Melbourne. And um, what happened was is that I, I actually ended up staying in New Zealand for two and a half weeks. I, I did the festival, then I went off. I um, I went to the, the John Lovey were the, the guys behind the festival. I went to their um, ancestral land up in the north, which is like private land you know, it's, uh, beaches and coastline like you've never seen before where there's, there's nobody on the beaches because it's private. I went there for a few days. I camped out with them. I, I, I went and spent a night on a, an island off the shore, like just in a sleeping bag and a, a, a campfire. Then I came back. I painted another mural in the same location as the festival had been held. And then I spent Christmas with them. And I just, I was treated like I was part of the family and I just got on super well with them. And I also really liked the, the Maori way of um, looking at the world. You know, they, they are completely different in, in a lot of ways. They're much more family orientated, much more roots orientated. And because of my life, you know, I, I, I don't really have roots. Yes, I'm from Ireland, but I've hardly spent any time there. I've never felt like I belonged anywhere. Uh, and I, I think that the, the way that they are just kind of like struck a chord with me. And so what I did was I became a sponsor for the festival. And so for the last three years, um, money that was generated from a uh, sale of prints down there has always gone straight into the, um, right. because the, the intention in the, in the first place was always to release a print, but put the money back into some, kind of Maori related um, charity or program um, and of course because I'm not there all the time it was it wasn't easy to find that project and then the people behind the festival just said well look you know you can invest in the festival and I thought well that's a good idea because I'm not only am I helping Maori people I'm actually helping the artist community as well. What's the, so what's the name of the festival and where, which, which sort of town is it? The festival is called Street Prints, and they've done um, two or three in a place called Mount Monganui, which is a sim very symbolic place for the Maoris. Um, they've done one in Christchurch, and they've done one in Palmerston North, and they've done one in... Oh, I've forgotten the other one. <laughs> but they, they do them all over. And the, all right. Uh, if things go according to plan next year, they're going to be in two separate locations as well. And actually, they might even be doing one in Japan. Oh, sounds fantastic. And my, my role, as well as giving money from the sale of the prints, um, is also to curate the international artists. So it's, it's my job to suggest which international artists should come because, you know, they do, they do a very good mix of local and, and international. There's more local than there is international, and that's the way it should be. And also there's people who are at the, the top of their game and people who are just starting. And they also do like a, a youth um, mentoring kind of um, program where the, the, each artist has one or two uh, young people helping them out or just being there with them and taking advice, et cetera, et cetera. And they also do workshops with various artists as well. I've never actually done a workshop simply because I'm always too busy trying to get my wall finished, you know. Yeah, well, you've got big walls there. <laughs> so, so, so this area, so that's, that's, that's how it all began then. It, it, it yeah. was born out of a, just a really good, strong relationship that you built with, with, with some people down there, and, 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 and that's created everything. Essentially how I've done everything in, in my that's art great. career. 
yeah even even the galleries that i've worked with i've i've worked with them not because i thought they were good galleries but because i felt instinctively that they were right for me and yeah. that that's essentially the reason i work that way is because of the previous life i was talking about you know the the split from my ex-partner uh, had been foreseen for quite some time my instincts had been telling me that there was something wrong but i didn't listen to them and when i came out of that and realized how much my life was messed up i just thought well, why wasn't i listening to my instincts they were obviously advising me right and so from that point on i just i've done that and here we are and it seems to have done done you right actually yeah, yeah. it's worked yeah. for sure <laughs> And I'm, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks very much for talking to me on our line. That's been really great to talk to you, mate. Um, yeah, and have a great rest of your week. Thanks for having me. Take care.